Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Okay. So <clears throat> session before after the lunch is always hard. But one thing I wish I can say is we will be looking into some interesting stuff. You know, we'll have more interactions between us, you know, like what I wanted the agenda is basically wanted you guys to try this out after going out of this meeting. So shall we start? Okay, uh, about myself, um, I'm Surendra Nitraj. Uh, I, as uh, he said, I'm, I'm a project lead in expansion. I'm very enthusiastic in, uh, in terms of automating non-functional re requirements along with your functional automation. Sounds interesting, right? We will speak, to, uh, speak about it a uh, lot. You know, this one, <clears throat> this slide which actually we are going to talk about is one such automation process, okay? And how we are going to integrate with uh, the security and then, uh, in your TDD process is what you're going to see. Okay, you can connect me in, uh, in my LinkedIn page. Okay, I said let's have an interactive session. Okay, so probably I'll start with questions. You can raise your hands and you can start. This actually sets the context. Okay, so how many of you in this room think that security testing is important? Yeah, almost all hands. Second question. How many of you are doing security testing in your sprint? One, two. I think I got the problem. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The problem is, you know, like even uh, our keynote speaker today spoke about that. You know, like uh, we know the importance of security, and uh, security is very important, and we all know, but we don't do it. Somewhere, a lot like quality, you know, like we compromise on security, right? Okay. The persons who, who have raised their hands, I want to ask one more question to them. How frequently you do that? Nightly run? Is it? Good. If you're doing it almost every sprint, it's really good. But not practically, it's not, you know, not many people are actually doing that. Okay, we will see like how to automate this. You know, uh, again, I'm going back to the keynote speaker who spoke about, you know, like he, she gave me a very good context. She, she gave me a very good baseline. You know, like uh, we need to do, you know, we have to think from, uh, you know, security from a development perspective and we want to automate that, right? So those two keywords are very important. Okay, now, considering all these things, at the end of the presentation, probably I'll ask you the same question, you know, whether are we really, uh, the solution which I'm providing, are, uh, are we really satisfying that? Okay. Okay. I had the slide because you know uh, I know everybody knows important security, but just wanted to emphasize on one more one more point, and that is, it's not like you know uh, last two years or before or something like that. Nowadays, security has become more sensitive, right? I wanted to cite an example of Ashley Madison, right? You know that that's, everybody knows the hack of Ashley Madison and what is the impact it's made. We had. You know, there were some lives lost, lost as well. Or think about yourself. You know, you're, you're surfing your net, doing some banking transactions. At the end, if it goes, yeah, I can't, I can't even think about it. If you just, just do an, an analysis of it, you know, like what I found is, you know, that's my personal opinion, what I found is with this faster development and with this agile model, we, we are actually not doing security. You know, even in a regular way that we don't see security at all. Do you agree? Right? That's, that's exactly. And the second point I wanted to make is the skills. People think, you know, I'm not a security tester. I'm an automation tester. Uh, me too. I'm also an automation tester. But you know what? Uh, we, we used to do Veracode testing. You know, this, this eventually turned up that, this way, that we used to do Veracode testing in the fag end of my uh, release. How many of you do that? You know, we do a static scan or dynamic at the end, and what we end up is basically we we almost retest whatever we tested in the sprint, right? I don't want to do that. I want it to be in the development side, okay? I'm, and having it automated is going to help me out in achieving this, okay? I don't know, and there's there is no uh, dependency uh, created in here. An automated process will actually help me to do this in a very cleaner way. One more point. If you guys are doing it due to the fast delivery, are we really missing, you know, are we really treating all the security bugs? But if you are trying to pitch in in terms of from the development cycle onwards, you are going to achieve that, right? Let's take a conventional TDD process. 
simple error test. You repeat your, execute your test. If it success, you add another test. If it just create a suit all of it, yeah. Now let's try to include a security angle to that. Okay. How many of you understand static, dynamic, and forensic? Or depending upon your response, probably I can just explain a couple of words on that. Okay. Okay. So static basically from the from your coding side, you know, like when I'm trying to do, you can use uh, tools like you know find bugs, uh, and then try to understand, you know, like where exactly in terms of my code, what are my vulnerabilities, what what could be done better. Or how could I do better in terms of security aspects? It comes along with other stuff as well, like performance, etc. But still, the focus right now is on security. Okay, uh, this is a normal process in most of development centers. But one thing which you're really missing is the dynamicity, right? Uh, as as today she pointed out, you know, 70 percent, you know, 70 percent uh, due to phishing, you know, so cross-site scripting, clickjacking, uh, very common, especially when it comes to mobile. You have lots of ads coming up, and then you, you tend to click on those things. Forensics, of course, you wanted to understand like your data. The data becomes very important. Is there any leakage in your in through your logs or in through your system system logs or wherever you are trying to log it? So you have to verify that as well. So your static, your dynamic, as well as your forensic can be clubbed into theory process, and that actually eventually turned out to be security test driven development. Agreed. Okay, now let's try to implement this. You know, I'll just, show, I'll just showcase you guys in a small demo of it. You know, what I have done is I have taken uh, uh, find bugs uh, as my static scan, and have taken uh, test ng and have used OS Zap. Okay, I'm executing, going to execute my test using using Zap. You know, basically Zap is going to act like a proxy for me. Okay, it's not necessary that you know, like. Uh, Again, I'm reiterating the intention of it. It's not necessary that we have to use Zap. You can go with Wireshark. You can go with other tools in the market, uh, like a burp suit or something. But the point is, we have to, you know, when your functional automation covers almost your entire uh, crawling, so I'm just used. To, I'm using this uh, crawling which we are doing in functional automation in terms of Zap. Uh, you know, one of the person who I was just interacting with, he said, you know what? I don't do automation testing in that development phase. You know, I wanted to want my developers to get it faster. You know, Zap has an, uh, another way of doing that. You need not write an automation script as well. It has its own crawler. We can do that as well. But right off, uh, in this particular demo, what I'm going to showcase is I'm going to I'm going to start. You know, I have my code written. I'm going to uh, compile my code. I'm going to build my code, deploy it in Tomcat. And then use the find bugs, understand like where exactly and what are the security flaws from the static analysis perspective. And then moving forward, I will launch a Selenium uh, Chrome instance, you know, open the browser, perform my normal test execution, and then how Zap records it and how it's going to basically uh, does the active scan out of it and then gets a the result out of you. So that's exactly what it's going to be in this demo. Okay, what I did is basically I created a Jenkins job, you know, you know, combining all these things, you know, created an ant target and uh, or a Maven. You can do it with the Maven or ant, doesn't matter. So, uh, so you know, like it it replicates my almost like a uh, my developers do it. You know, basically they create a code locally, so everything is written locally. So I'm I'm deploying it locally using a Tomcat and then running my SAP instance locally. Let's see. configure <clears throat> so I have my code written uh, with me and then I'm use a target of find bugs where actually it will it, it has a dependency of targets of uh, compiling and building it and then it goes to the find bugs and tries to uh, do your uh, analysis on your uh, static static side and then I, I, I invoke my test using a, my normal test automation scripts have been written in Maven, and then I'm just trying to uh, run my test using Maven test. So it's simple, right? Nothing much uh, from your CI perspective. 
or a TDD perspective. So let me just run this. Okay. What you're able to write now seeing is basically um, it compiles my code, then it starts building it, and it deployed it in Tomcat, and now it's going, it's trying to find these uh, static analysis, static code uh, uh, using find bugs. So. I think let by the time it runs, you know, you, if you have any questions, you can also ask. You know, like let's make it more interactive. You know, you have the build successful. You know, I got the bugs from your stat, from your static side. Now I'm going to I'm just invoking my automation test. I have invoked the zap. We can do it in a daemon mode, uh, but however, I'll just use it so that you guys understand that the zap has been launched. So I'll have my security. Sorry, Selenium. Script, which this is my uh, application, so it just went through. It's a local host, it's so faster. So you now it just went through and just did, did an, uh, a functionality for me. And when I'm doing it, I started recording it in the back. And I'm, when I'm saying recording, is basically I'm trying to do get it all your HTTP monitoring traffics and then start doing the analysis. Okay. Before I just showcase you the uh, reports and all those things, you know, two things which you have to consider is, you know, uh, it's basically a zap can give you false positives, right? So what we did is like, yeah, we did get some false positives as well. So what we did is like we created a filter out of it. You know, you know what? Uh, for my application, SQL and uh, cross-site cross -site scripting, you know, that these are more important for me rather than uh, your X frames. Just, just giving an example. So what happens is like I'm filtering the, uh, my, my required bugs, you know, so that even um, any automation tester or uh, a manual person who's trying to use it can also raise bugs out of it, okay? And if you guys are starting fresh, you know, Zap is one of the good tools to start off with if you're thinking in terms of security, okay? You can, of course, go with Burp. I would re really recommend Burp. Uh, and you all can also go with uh, Wireshark. We will see how we will do it with uh, other tools like in uh, APM. So, yeah. So I have my reports. I'm more concerned about the security, so I see six instances where I know you know SQL could be injected. So, so I get from a code perspective. Now, sorry. Uh, this is what, uh, the filtered report which we create uh, from expansion. You know, basically it, it basically does the filtering from your Zap report, and then gives you in a, uh, you know better you know critical bugs so that you can actually uh, raise those bugs directly to your developer. Okay. So if you just go back, uh, if I wanted to have the complete Zap report, you can click here. Yeah, you get the complete Zap report. Uh, Again, Zap is going to tell you like what exactly the bug is, you know how how we can resolve it, you know what are the remedies of doing this, you know. Uh, we, I'm not saying that you know we we can uh, you know we are trying to overcome something like a Vera code, which is which is very standard in the market. What we are saying is when you go to the Vera code in the end of your sprint or end of your release, again you are taking most more time and whatever you have developed would be re you'd be redoing it. Right. So whereas when you have these kind of tools, you know, where actually you can automate it and ensure that, you know, like it's much, you know, uh, when you go to Veracode, you don't have much, much, a lot of bugs already in place. And it'll be easier uh, for, uh, for anybody uh, to basically get those security flaws from your application. Okay, 
So, okay. Now, and you see it, you know, like uh, the SQL injection variable was, was identified from a static, but your X frames were not able to identify from your static scan, right? But it, it can be it could be possible only when you're trying to do with a black box testing approach, when you're trying to do a dynamicity uh, to it, then only it's really possible. So dynamic analysis is very important, and your cross-site scripting, everything would be part of it only through dynamic. You cannot find it through, you know, until you try it out, you know, like uh, with your... Uh, with your application. So uh, dynamic analysis is very important, uh, and, and especially with, uh, with most of the vulnerabilities are towards dynamic. So the, if you're going static, very good. But if you have to think about from dynamic perspective as well. OK. Agile, now you see Agile. So if you see Agile now, I have put in a small security angle to it. Of course, yes, when you're starting with the design, you would go with a thread modeling. You know. Uh, few companies do it, few companies do not. You know, but when you start with the development, of course you can do with the SAST and the, the DAST as well as part of uh, as part of your proxies. So uh, the, these tools, like you know, uh, whatever tools are specified, they support proxies. Or if you get, if you're thinking from an iOS perspective, you can think from an iMass. Uh, it's a very good tool to use for. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, as I said, you know, you have your forensic, you have a dynamic as static as well. You know, there are the displayed as a uh, few tools which we have tried. Okay. You can do the same thing with APM as well. You know, uh, again, it, it depends on the tool you're, you're selecting and uh, uh, your, uh, uh, again, your, uh, your logger which you're selecting and you're trying to identify the bugs out of it. So uh, when you see from a static perspective, uh, right now I showed you a demo of find bugs. You can integrate. You have a plugin uh, of Sonar Cube with FindBugs. You can you can do that plugin and then you can get that, uh, or even it, you can do it with your Eclipse as well. Um, so, uh, if you think from an Android perspective, Lint is one of the good tools to use for. You can think about that. Uh, yeah. So, of course, you have Veracode, and for the uh, HP services, you have the Fortify client. Uh, the the IMAS can be leveraged from your static as well as from a dynamic perspective as well. Uh, you require the source code of that particular application, and uh, being uh, doing an STD process, you should be able to use IMAS in a better way. Okay. Uh, if you're thinking from a web application perspective, I would recommend personally with Wireshark. You know, Wireshark is really good. Uh, it gives you more depth coverage, whereas when you take Zap, if you're new to the security area, you, you can think about Zap. Because Zap uh, gives you know the top ten vulnerabilities, and they get updated almost every three years. So you can think about Zap to start off with, and then move on to Wireshark. Yeah, from a forensic perspective, you can create some Splunk dashboards, which you can you can use uh, and uh, you know and uh, find it out whether you have any uh, you know any passwords getting leaked or any sensitive information getting leaked out of it. You know you can use your Android logger as well to do the same. So uh, Splunk is a, is a very good tool for uh, doing your forensic analysis, especially with your logs. Any questions now? Sure. You know, like, that's what I say, you know, like, uh, again, Zap is one tool. If you're thinking from Zap perspective as well, you know, like, uh, you need not use the proxy mode of Zap. You can actually go for uh, the spidering mode of Zap, which actually requires your URL, you know, that, or your application uh, launch, right? So once you have this URL, it has its own spider, which actually access it. It crawls you uh, the other pages and starts doing the, uh, you need not, you're not dependent on your automation. 
No, that's what I said. You're not even doing automation in that case. You're doing with Zap itself. So it becomes local to your uh, developer. But still, you know, like it, it, it's going to use Selenium in, internally, the, the spidering. And then, but it's not through your, uh, uh, what do you say? It's not through your automation. It's done by Zap itself. Okay. So it cannot be included in Selenium that. Yeah, it in, internally uses Selenium, right? You know, uh, so, you know, Zap internally uses Selenium which to, for doing a browser navigation. So what it does is uh, it, you have to give your Chrome path to that or Firefox path to that or uh, any the driver path to that. And once you give that driver path, it's when you start doing spidering and Ajax spidering. So when it starts, it launches a Selenium server internally and then gives you the uh, target URL and starts navigating with all the links in, inside that. So that, that's an answer to your first question. The second question from terms of logs, that's why I said Splunk is a very good tool. You know, Splunk, you can create dashboards out of it. You can give regular expressions to that, you know, like just in case if I have, you know, let's say I have in a debugger mode, I have given a password, you know. Uh, if my password does not have any asterisks into it, it has some characters to it, then probably you can find, find it through a Splunk dashboard. So Splunk is a very powerful tool and you need a separate session for that. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions as of now? Yeah, please. So here, we have a question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in the example you gave where Jenkins was using uh, a Selenium and OWASP app, um, yeah. were you, is it doing a passive scan of Selenium or is it, watching what Selenium does and then doing an active scan? No, it does this active scan, actually. So what, what, do you, what do you do with along with automation is basically to get the, uh, your HTTP traffic, basically. So the, uh, the automation comes into picture when you're trying to do with your HTTP traffic. So I, I wanted to navigate, say, a certain set of pages. I don't want to go to the complete application. Then I can go with the automation approach of the proxy mode of using the proxy mode of Zap. Yeah, but ultimately, you should do the active scan with prior, prior uh, uh, permissions. So this sort of the Selenium process that runs, stops, and then the OWASP starts, and that's what it does? Uh, see, the proxy basically, uh, yeah, probably I'll just, uh, no, I can show that to you. Just give it uh, two minutes, and I can show that how basically when I say proxy mode, like what exactly the URLs you get. You know, you get the CSS, you get the uh, uh, the other parts of it. You know, getting embedded with along in your uh, uh, in your Zap. So that's exactly how proxy works. Yeah. Right, I understood that. It's a matter of so there's like a process of Selenium, and then OWASP is watching what Selenium does. Yes, yes. And then once that's over, OWASP uses that information to do. I Correct. Guess. Exactly. And are you tweaking active scanning, or is there any? We like, can tweak it if you require, because we have the Zap APIs available. So you can, you can, if you want to tweak it, you can, you can definitely tweak it. Thanks. Yeah. So. You can see in the sites basically it starts, it starts getting your URLs. So, yeah. So if I'm concerned about certain set of pages, then the proxy mode's a better mode because you won't have any control when you're trying to do with your Ajax spidering. So again, it, it's the only way of doing it Zap. You can do it with other tools as well. I know one of the challenges that I face uh, using Zep Proxy is uh, trying to uh, uh, route requests on a, on a remote uh, Zap instance. Have you been able to uh, 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 accomplish that? Yeah, uh, what we did is like uh, we created a Maven plugin where actually you can specify the session in which if I wanted to connect to. So even if it's remotely uh, available for me, 
and I would I can use a session ID and then connect to that particular session. Does it answer your question? You know, uh, if I can repeat your question, basically you're trying to say that you know if I have an existing session or if my Zap is available uh, in my remote, would I be able to do that? Is that right? Right. So so let's hypothetically say. We, I have uh, two nodes. On the first node, that's where I'm uh, uh, running my Selenium test, or, or, or uh, just that's that's pretty much where I'm, I'm making my request on the first node, and my and on the second node, that's where the Zap instance lives. Yeah. So I want to wrap my request to that second node where you know the remote Zap instance is. That's the challenge that I face because I keep you know I'm just trying to figure out how you've been able to accomplish that. Yeah, I haven't faced that issue, frankly. You know, uh, we have it uh, in one of the uh, remote servers, and we were able to create a session independently, so through the APIs. Uh, so, try with the latest version. Probably you won't face it, face it as well. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So what's the main difference and uh, I mean? Okay, uh, on a layman level, I'll say that's an it's an Zap is an open source and you have a you know uh, it's a paid version and it's a licensed one and you get basically if you see uh, it's on the uh, uh, on the number of security flaws it covers in the coverage perspective is a major difference. So when you uh, when you have your tool actually it covers more than considering with Zap. Zap is has uh, majorly focus on the top 10 vulnerabilities. Yeah, please. So with Python, are you using out-of-the-box configs, or do you have special configs that focus on security? Could you come again, please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, with Firebox, do you have custom configs that focus on security holes, or do you just use out-of-the-box out Firebox configuration? Yeah, again, the find bugs is one of the aspects, you know, one of the tools. But I think uh, we have we have actually tweaked it with respect to uh, security. Uh, in this in this case, actually, uh, what I showed it to you is completely the complete analysis of the fire, uh, find bugs. Uh, but practically, when we implemented it, we have done with with respect to our uh, architect suggestions. So it, it is customized. For the security scans, right, some of the tests you need to, for example, call internal utility and things, uh, how can we bypass those scans? Uh, could you come again, please? So if your, uh, for example, your, your tests need to call like uh, in um, the utility inside the company. Okay. Okay, so but you don't want to waste the time to test those calls. Okay. You can, you have an, and like, I'm not sure about the uh, other tools, but uh, in Wireshark as well as in uh, Zap, you have the in scope and out of scope items, you know, where actually you can specify that, you know, you have to consider these URLs, the other utilities can be, uh, can be given to as an out of scope. So it won't consider those kind of URLs. So I've heard you and a lot of other people talking about false positives of Zap. Um, yep. I'm wondering, I guess, like, can you give a ballpark percentage of true to false signals? And also, is there a particular kind of um, analysis that Zap is better or worse at, like XSS versus you know whatever else? Uh, okay. From from an uh, XSS perspective, as well as uh, uh, from your SQL perspective, Zap is a very good tool. Frankly, it gives you very minimal false positives. But whereas when you go, when you try to go towards your uh, uh, your attributes, HTTP attributes and uh, your X frames, I think it gives a lot of false positives. You know that's where actually Zap is a little bit you know vulnerable. So uh, that's why you said you know like what we did is like we created a filter out of it. So you know uh, it's a it's a simple idea. You know when you when you start getting a lot of data, you can use a filter to basically filter out what is exactly you require. So and what you you wanted to focus on. So. Any other questions? Okay.
Hi. So I am new to the security testing. I'm okay. Security testing. So my question is, uh, can we include these uh, security testing in our regular regression runs? So do you recommend that? Uh, I think one of the gentlemen here pointed out that you know it, it's going to take more time. That's the only only uh, concern if you're trying to put that in the regression. You know, ideally, I would suggest you to put it inside your smoke. You know, uh, where actually you are navigating to complete all the pages, and then you can actually you get the faster results out of as well. Okay. So uh, another question is, do you recommend this on the even on the production server? It's only on the. Uh, no, I won't recommend it on the production server. It should be with you know. Uh, either with your staging or with your QA. Thank you. Yeah. Or with your dev as well. <laughs> okay. I'm almost done, guys. You know, probably uh, now you can, you guys can say that, you know, whatever we, we took the problem statements, are we really satisfying the problem statements? If you guys agree, you can raise your hands up. Okay, so people who don't agree, can you, if you have any questions, you know, we can discuss over it. We still have a few minutes left. Yeah. One of the major concerns that uh, we have deals with complex net applications that are basically being driven from a UI interface. And quite often the security holes are not per se in the application itself, but through any number of uh, web devices that are downstream, routers, gateways, switches, whatever, that have misconfigurations. Do you perceive that any of these tools uh, singly or in combination would be suitable for catching and trapping that kind of a security hole? Mm. Probably, you know, I uh, haven't tried in that, in that angle, frankly speaking. You know, like, uh, it's more what we did is, again, uh, it's more on the application side, you know, from your web, web and native side as well, you know, but it's totally, uh, no, I haven't tried it from the other angle in terms of the switches and other stuff. Probably some food for thought. Thank you. Just curious, roughly speaking, how often do you find security holes with this system that you have here? And then, when you do, what happens? Like, for your organization, mm -hmm. do you have a, a review? Do you have, like, team meetings and discuss what happens? Yeah, see, uh, uh, we have few clients. You know, we have a service-based company. You know, like, uh, uh, we don't have any security experts as such. You know, what we are trying to do with this kind of an approach is basically, uh, with the help of the, uh, the system architects which we have, we uh, ensure that you know we have these uh, setting already done with the filtering already done, and then we start whenever there is a development uh, phase happening. We we ha we run this process and we are able to uh, reduce the time which actually we are get, uh, we are uh, investing in the end of the sprint or end of the release. So, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but so let's say a developer introduced some horrible security issue yeah. and. Is there anything that happens on the management side? Do you have like, do you do a postmortem and say, oh well, this was introduced. Let's let's try to avoid this going forward. Yeah, it de it depends on the severity of it. That's what I said. You know, the, the filter comes into picture for me in that in that particular sense. You know, like if I if I uh, get a bug in terms of cross site scripting, then I have to fix it immediately. Whereas when you when I, it comes from the X frames, I can handle it later. So that that prioritization would be taken. You know, in uh, when you're doing your sprint analysis itself. Um, similar to uh, tools like Sonar that do static code analysis, um, I, I'm assuming that uh, the Zap tool provide, uh, provides you the ability to um, prioritize uh, bugs that it's logging. So in the scenario you mentioned where I don't care that much about X frames in the current scenario, yeah, current yeah. application. Can I set that to low priority or set it to? Yeah, one? not from a Zap perspective. That's you know, Zap doesn't allow you to configure that. You know, what we did is like uh, whatever Zap is giving over that, we had kept a filter of, over it. So the prioritization is is from our side. So you have to filter through the results. Yeah, yeah. We filter through the results, results and give you in a in a presentable format. Oh, cool. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, I just wanted to specify one more thing, you know, like, uh, uh, again, from a tool's perspective, Zap is, again, uh, we have a Docker image available for that. You can actually use it, uh, the Docker image as well, and uh, you actually ended up, end up with doing your DevOps operations as well with, with the help of uh, Zap Docker. So that's another piece of information which I wanted to share with you guys. Okay, uh, I think, uh, yeah. I think these are some references you know we can, you can uh, you can refer that's it thank you